I'm going to throw some, because what you're going to, I know what you're going to hear next week, because I've looked at it. What you're going to hear is a whole lot of stuff that's not based on Bible. It's, it's based a lot on human reasoning. It has to be this because this and this and this. Oh, okay. And we're looking out and, and looking at stuff. What we need to do when we're trying to figure out timing, when we're trying to figure out everything, I try and say, go back and find it in the Bible. If you can find some evidence of what you're trying to prove in the Bible, then, then we've got something. So we're just going to take a short detour on the timing of the year. Just so you're... So you've got some preloaded ideas before you go and do this. Because I'm a firm believer, if you know the true, mm -hmm. the counterfeit's really easy to figure out. Mm -hmm. It just like yells at you when you see it. All you're looking at is the counterfeit, or if you haven't had an opportunity to hear what's mm -hmm. true, that's why all these sun Sunday keepers, they just you start looking at them and start questioning about, well, what is the Bible? They have no idea because all they've studied is a counterfeit. One thing that... I think is pretty easy to establish by Bible is that whatever timing the Pharisees were doing for Passover and for Sabbath and for everything, mm -hmm. Yeshua was doing exactly the same thing because their questions and their accusations were what he was doing at these appointed times, not what time he was keeping it. If they could nail him on keeping it at a different time, which would have been a wrong time as far as they were concerned because they thought they had the truth, if he was keeping a different time, that would have been pointed out. But never did they say, you're keeping it at the wrong time. It was what he did on that time that they were accusing him. So there's no question they were keeping the same. So, so then, if Yeshua and the Pharisees were keeping it at the same time when he walked the earth, then at some time between... 2,000 years ago, and today, that's where the change was made. I've never seen anyone give me any evidence that there was a change from the time when Yeshua. It's always, oh, it was pre-change, like Babylon change or, or sometime in that. Oh, no, does somebody use that text to prove a different timing in the feast? Tell me no. Yeah. Tell me no, they don't use that. Oh, my. Oh. The text where it says, my time is not, you go up to the feast, my time's not come. Is that somebody? No, tell me, tell me no. My time is not yet. Yeah, I go up next week because you guys are keeping it. Don't, don't tell me somebody used that text. Please don't tell me that. Oh, talk about out of context. I'll show you. I'll show you what he was meaning. He knew that if he went up, he could be his execution. My time to die has not yet come. He says, your time is always ready. You guys, you could die anytime. Now, to prove that, go to John chapter 13. That was John chapter 7. They're going up to the Feast of Tabernacles, he says, because his brothers were saying, hey, let's go. Let's go, come on. Now, how could it, reasonably speaking, his brothers were raised in the same family as Mary and Joseph. Don't, somebody please tell me that they were all keeping the feast at the same time. I mean, they got the same parents. Yep. They're all keeping the feast at the same time. Yep. Yeshua wasn't telling them that I keep the feast at a different time. Okay. That can't be what he was saying. My time's not ready. I can't, it's not my time to die. It's not my time to die. I'm going to wait. The Jews were already laying traps for him. Now, to prove that point, um, somebody pray. Father in heaven, we come together again to look at your word. And we, we thank you that we have truth in your word. And we ask, Father, because we claim to be your children and we want to claim to walk in your ways, we need your spirit to lead us and guide us. Father, we want to give ourselves into your hand to do your will, but we can't do it unless we have your spirit and your spirit's leading. As Yeshua said, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you and lead you into all truth. We claim that promise here tonight. 
We ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Okay, so, John chapter, this is John again, right? Same author. Uh, so, in John, at the end of the chapter of John, he says, these things are written that you would know the timing of the feast. John chapter, let's go to John chapter 20. John 20, verse 30, 31. And truly, Yeshua did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So John's total focus here was to demonstrate that Yeshua was the Messiah. So if we go back to John chapter... 13, you remember what we just read there is that Yeshua said, my time has not yet come. So we got the same thing going on here in, in John chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of Passover, when Yeshua knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. So this is saying he knew that his time had come. John at Tabernacles said of Yeshua, that Yeshua said, my time has not yet come. So if he says my time has come, that means the hour of his death had come. If he goes up to Jerusalem at Tabernacles and... Uh, if he went up at the wrong time, he could, be, he could be killed. They knew that. The disciples never wanted to go to Jerusalem that much because they were trying to kill him. Then he wouldn't be able to fulfill all the prophecies. Right. His time was at Passover. Um, okay. So let's just, let's just have a little bit of fun here. Okay. So... In the beginning, John 1.14, let's, let's do this, let's do it on this side, or not John, um, Genesis 1.14, what does that say? Let's explore that. So let's break that down. Let's try and make some sense out of that text. Okay, so it says that the sun and the moon and the stars are for signs. And seasons. Okay. What's the word sign? What is that word? So that's the word oath. And give us the meaning of that. Covenant? Yeah. <clears throat> In the sense of appearing, a signal, literally or figuratively, as a flag, beacon, monument, omen, prodigy, evidence, etc. And it is mark, miracle, sign, or token. Okay, so, so, so the word itself means a sign, an omen, mark, whatever. So, because it's got all these different words that it, and in each one, if you took one, it's just a little different slant. So, if we can, now our problem is, is which one of these words are we going to pick? Now, it's interesting that if we let the Bible interpret itself, we don't have any problem here. It says that the sun and the moon and the stars are for these things and these things. Okay? If you go to Luke, it says there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. So that's an interesting concept. So they're for markers. They mark off and we can know what's going on because we have markers. In Revelation, we see markers. I saw a mountain falling into the sea like a burning mountain. That's a sign. That's one of these things in the heavens that are rocking around. So we can see these are signs that we know what's following because what follows is going to be what follows that sign. So we have that. Now what is this? Does, let me just back up. Does this have anything to do with the clock? No. It could be the prophetic clock. It could be an alarm bell go off that we need to look at the clock. 
but it's not the clock itself. It's just an alarm because the signs in the sun and the moon and the star mean something. Yeshua said that means something. You're in, you're in trouble. Trouble's coming. So what is that word? We all know that word. Okay, what is that? That's appointed times. So the sun and the moon and the stars are also for appointed times. So how is the sun for an appointed time? It's, it says, it says there, we don't have to guess, it says for days, and what else? Days, years, for days and years. How does the, how does the sun work for days? We know, yeah, exactly. We get a rotation of the earth. And we get a day and a night that equals a 24-hour period. And then a year, it's one, by definition, it's one, whether you have a flat earth or not, it's one, one revolution around the sun. That's the definition of a year. It's not a certain amount of days. It's how long it takes to go around the sun. Today, that is 365 question we need to ask, is that always the way it was? It doesn't seem like it. And we got Bible for this. It says at the time of the flood, we can look this up, at the time of the flood in chapter 7, I think, of Genesis, it says it was five months and 150 days. That means we got 30-day months at the time of the flood. So we know at the time of the flood, they had 360-day years, which would have meant that would be what it would be at creation because there was no catastrophic event before that. Does that make sense? Yeah. This is all Bible. Yeah. Where is that at? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Why, why is a circle... Everywhere on the planet divided into 360 degrees. Because that's how long it takes to go around the sun. And everything was broken, in, a circle is broken into 360 degrees. That's what our calendar is. Our calendar teaches that. And so at the time of the flood, and I love it, is that Noah says that in the second month, on the 17th day, that means Noah knew what month it was, the second month. So that second month would have been the same second month that they started on creation. Would have had to be. Then there was no interruption up until the time of Noah. So he was on that same calendar. And so he was counting 30-day months. And uh, a lot of people have problems with that. But that's if we're going to use the Bible, we've got to stick with the Bible. Otherwise, we're just guessing. So we know that Noah said 150 days, I think he says the water started receding, and then he also said that that was five months. So we divide five into that, we get 30-day months. Not anything else. You can't get any other number but that. So he was keeping, and on a 365-day calendar, you're not going to get that. You're going to get a different number than that. So, that, so we know that. Now, this is what uh, a lot of people leave out. Let's just take this off because we need a little more room. Now, in the, in the creation, in the creation of the world, a lot of scientists, creation scientists, we're just going to do a little detour here. A lot of creation scientists were trying to figure out what the earth was like before the destruction at the time of the flood. In Genesis, it says that he came and he said that waters were everywhere, covered the face of the earth. It was called the abyss. And water was everywhere. And then God said on the, what was the second day? He separated the waters on the earth from the waters in the heavens. And he made an atmosphere. 
So what he did was the water here, he separated and he made the waters in the heavens. Okay, now just stay with me here for a sec. There's no real detail on how this happened. But what the creation scientists, most creation scientists believe what God did there was he created a greenhouse in the earth by doing this. So when the sun rays came on here, it would have been exactly the same temperature. The pla planet would have been the same temperature, a moderate temperature, a beautiful day every day of the week. Now that does make a lot of sense because when Noah was preaching the time of the flood, he was preaching that it was going to rain. They had never seen rain. Everyone knows, every Bible student knows, oh, well, he, they didn't see rain and that's why they didn't believe it. Well, nobody stops to think, yeah, it says a mist came up from the earth and watered the ground. It doesn't say a rain came. They didn't have rain before the flood. It was in the morning, right? it, that's Bible. It says that that's how the ground was watered. A mist comes up. And if you're in different areas of the world, and at certain times of year, you can, you can actually see that mist. You go into an area, and it's just misty in the morning. It's water moisture. So, and, and furthermore, they've taken... You know, up at the, north, let's just say this, the North Pole, South Pole, they've d dug stuff out of the tundra, and as the ice is receding, they've actually found this stuff basically on the surface. Mammoths and, and uh, camels, they found tropical animals up on the North Pole. And they're trying to figure out, well, what's going on here? Well, at the time of the flood, these things were everywhere because there was a moderate climate everywhere on the planet. It was, it was just like that. So all this ice, it's interesting. When you take absolute zero, I understand. I've never been there. But I understand at absolute zero is that ice or snow, ice and snow becomes magnetic. So if you've got a north and south pole at the time of the flood, that's where the creation scientists believe that's why you had all the ice caps here is because in absolute zero the ice would have been attracted to here. So the ice has been retreating all through the time from the time of the flood. So ice is magnetic at that temperature which seems kind of weird but that's apparently you can google that and find that out. Um, okay so at the time of the flood it says that the windows of heaven were opened. And we, we don't really stop and think what that means. Well, this was actually a greenhouse effect with, made with water. So God made this greenhouse effect with water would, would have been clear, crystal clear. So the sun could have come in here. And so the, this was broken at the time of the, head, uh, time of the flood. So this now has disappeared. We don't have that anymore. That was all broken. That's where all the rain came from. All this water crashed down on the earth. That's why it was a worldwide flood, because this was a, an envelope of water around the whole earth. So this is, this is what happened, and it flooded the earth. So when Noah got off the ark, it, God had a story for him, uh, chapter 8. Genesis. So, if you can just imagine for a moment living in the time before the flood. Um, who's lived in a tropical place before? Anybody here? Well, I've been to Hawaii ten times. Yeah. You've been to Hawaii ten times. Did you like the weather? I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've talked to people that live, um, you know, we try and get them up here for the feast, mm -hmm. and they live in, like, southern United States. Oh, it's so cold up there, I don't want to go up there. How much snow do you guys get? Oh, we get about three feet. Oh, how do you do it? <laughs> it's like, oh, it's just, it's almost pathetic. <laughs> but um, when you live in it, you have to get along with it. But um, this is the idea. So picture Noah 
living before the flood, a beautiful day every day. Sun is shining. Oh, I'm hungry. I go out to my yard and I pick that papaya or I pick that mango. And it's just like, wow, this is, this is living, right? This is the kingdom. And so he's got this kingdom. Then he gets off the ark. Things have changed. There's another change that I think happened at the time of the flood. Instead of that before the flood, it was that after the flood. And I got Bible to prove it. Do you know what I'm looking at here? The tilt of the earth. The poles being straight up and down. After the flood, it was on an angle. Now, what happens when you have a tilt? What does the tilt of the earth do? Right. Seasons. So, so here... We have sun shining on this thing. Well, up here, it's pretty dark back here. And so when you're, if you're in the north, if this is the north, and the earth is tilted like that, that's winter. Because you don't get a lot of sunshine. Most of it's spent in the dark. You only get a little bit in the day. It spins around here, but most of your time is, is very limited sunshine. But you move this thing over here now. So let's turn this guy into the sun and this into the earth. Let's keep the same shape like that. Let's keep the same. Now, this is just spinning around like this, right? But it's, it's going like it comes around the sun like that. And your days actually start to get longer and longer and longer and longer. And now this is the longest day of the year. This would be like June 21st. Are you following? You can do some homework on this. It's, it's hard when you first hear this to make sense out of it. That's, no, that's not the, that's the solstice, summer solstice. Over here would be the equinox because now I'm on an angle directly in line with the side of the earth on this angle. So I've got the same amount of sun and dark, same amount of light and day. So I, that's the same amount, equinox. That's, that's summer for me because the north side is getting a lot of sun. It's tilted towards the... Uh, because right in here, actually, the rays of the sun are actually hitting past. That's why if you're on the North Pole, there's no such thing as a sunset. In the, win in the summer, because they, it's bright all 24 hours a day. But I, if I get that thing over here now, it's in some places, they, the sun barely even comes up on the horizon. So, so if you've got your equinox here, this, in this drawing, this would be summer for the North Pole. And then you go around there, and that would be your equinox in the fall. And then you'd come around here, and you're, this would be your winter solstice over here, your darkest day. But in the south, you see in the south now, if this was over here, your south now is having summer. When the north is having winter, your south is having summer. These are all proofs that we're on a circle. We're on a ball here. And so same thing here. So when we're having summer here, in the south they're having winter. So that's, that makes sense. So, when Noah comes off the ark, God has something he's going to tell him. And Noah landed in the mountains of Ararat. And if you do homework in Ararat, it's in Turkey. And in the mountains in Turkey, it's much the same weather as here. Maybe a little bit warmer, uh, but it's much the same as here. When he got off the ark, it was in the spring of the year. It would have been cold. And so God told him something. He said, uh, in verse, chapter 8 of verse 20, it says, Then Noah built an altar to Jehovah, and he took every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a smooth aroma, a soothing aroma. And the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, 
and cold and heat, and winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. This is the change. Now, this very interesting, that's after the second curse, which is what came on after the flood. When God cursed the earth the first time, he says, well, you're going to have to eat your food with the sweat of your brow, and a woman's going to have pain and childbirth. That was the first curse. This is the second curse. Um, so here we have God saying, while the earth remains, this is the way it's going to be. It's like, Noah, I know you're not going to like this, but until the end... It's going to be like this now. So it was a huge change. They didn't have winter and summer before. Had to tell them that this is the way it's going to be. Right. You're going to have to make some coats now. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to have to plant your seed at the right time of year. Otherwise, you're not going to get a harvest. There was no longer or shorter days at the creation. So, so everyone that claims, oh, we got to go back to the creation. Okay, let's go back to the creation and see what it was. It was, it was completely different than... And that's because people aren't asking more questions. They think they have an apparent answer, but that's all it is. They haven't dug deep enough and really asked the question, why is God saying this? People read that and they read that and they why did God say that? Who's flown in an airplane before? A jet. You guys did. Did you ever push that button on the front uh, where the seat is? The eject button? No. No, you don't want to hit that one. There's, there's, a, there's a little window there. It's a little screen, a TV screen type thing. And you can, you can see where you are. There's also something else that's very interesting on there. It's a temperature gauge of the outside temperature. Have you ever seen that? Is it warm out there? Yeah, you wouldn't last very long. So what happened is, is space actually is super cold. Space is super cold. They've proven it. Without this canopy around, the cold air space, it comes in. Now, when the water came in, and the asteroids were a part of this as well, because they've proven the Earth was hitting, huge asteroids, when they come in, has anyone, here's another question, has anyone ever followed a semi? really close yeah. what do you notice get rock chips. <laughs> yeah you get rock chips what else i used to do this on my motorcycle you get inside that tunnel you don't even have you put it in neutral and you're just sucked along right so when these when these huge asteroids came in what are they bringing behind it Ice cold, ice cold, so cold, outer space cold is coming in behind them. When they broke through this water vapor, it turned all of this really super cold. And the ice particles would have gone to the poles because they're magnetic. And that's why we have a north and south pole. That's where all the ice had come from. But in, in the middle parts, it wouldn't have been massed there so much. So Turkey, if I was doing it, uh, Turkey would be somewhere in that area. Probably not too far off Canada, maybe just a little bit lower, maybe Oregon type of thing. But they get lots of snow in the mountains. So that's what Noah would have arrived at, something like that. So that's what, when this super cold came in from the asteroids, and asteroids were huge, coming in from all different directions, brought that super cold space air, and when it went through the water vapor, it would have turned a lot of it to ice, and then magnetized it. Kent Hovind, and there's some people that have done some work on the science part of that, he a, a, is a Christian, and it really makes a lot of sense um, when you follow that through. Okay, so... So that's at the time of the flood. So at the time of the flood, we got seasons. We got spring, winter, and we have seed time and harvest. So you got to plant because Noah was used to, if he wanted to plant, it didn't matter what time of year he planted, he would have a harvest in 50 days, 60 days, whatever the, the thing was going to do. Also says night and day. What, and I already know the answer to this, but what do you think that it could be talking about with night and day. Now, the other research that's been done 
if there was a canopy around this that protected the earth to keep the ultraviolet rays out and so on, keep a moderate planet uh, temperature all the way around, when the sun hit this, what actually happened is it illuminated it. So what, what the creation scientists believe that this water canopy was like a fiber optic. So when the sun hit this, if this was clear as crystal and the sun hit that, it would create a glow around the whole earth. Which actually does make a lot of sense. It says in the, in the kingdom, in the new earth, there will be no night there. Now, why, why do we have night now? Because men's hearts aren't evil continually. God has given us night so that we sleep. Because if the evil that we can contrive, and we had a 24-hour day, just think how evil the earth would be today. Just think how evil the earth would be if we never slept. Really, seriously, think about it. God has actually allowed the earth to decay to a certain point, allowed our bodies to decay to a certain point where we have to lay down and have sleep. That's a way to preserve us. Otherwise, we would have destroyed ourselves thousands of years ago. Really, that's, that's the reality of it. We would have destroyed ourselves. So he's allowed all these things to happen to preserve mankind because he had a plan for man. And he needed to have him shut down because he knew how long his plan was going to take. But what we can know by this is what, what I think this is telling us here because we know we have summer and winter. So that's contrasting. So now we have summer and winter as opposed to any day of the year you could plant a seed. And you got seed time and harvest. So these are the changes. Why the change of day and night? I believe because this canopy... And I'm not the only one. There's lots of... Uh, I would say most of the creation scientists would believe this. Um, so when this was knocked out, they lost this. And that's why it says day and night. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that would have kept the earth warmer as well? This canopy? Yeah. It's a greenhouse. A greenhouse. This whole yeah. thing was a greenhouse. Right. That's why they found tropical animals yeah. at the North Pole. Yeah. Because... They would have been everywhere. The animals would have been everywhere. And they found in caves animals on certain continents and stuff, those animals are not there today. Yeah. They're on this side of the world. Well, the fact is all the animals were everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so this is what, what they're proving. So at the time of the flood, we've got this happening. That was the change. That brought the, the spring and the winter. Also brought the seasons because now you have to plant your seed at the right time of year, and it also brought the darkness. So you've got the changes at the time of the flood lifted at the time of the flood. So this changed that. Now also what happened is we know that the earth was hit with asteroids big time, and that's what I believe tilted it, because those things brought a lot of pressure on it. And if you hit something, you can... If you've ever taken a top and thrown something at a top, if it's spinning, it'll keep spinning, but it'll, it'll start to wobble. Totter to and fro yeah. like a drunkard. So yeah. Yeah, so this is, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's a future event. It's happened in the past. The, the, it looks like it's happened in the past. So uh, there was one, oh yeah. So we know the asteroids. So if the asteroids had enough power to, to tilt this thing, when we look at the moon, it's got circles all over it. People say it looks like Swiss cheese, but that Swiss cheese is actually asteroid hits. And so when you've got something that's a little bit smaller than the Earth, I propose that we used to have a 30-day moon cycle, but now it's 29 and a half because this thing got swung out of orbit just a little bit. That's why it's so clear, and there's no atmosphere, there's no wind, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So they're still there, and that's a testimony. That's God's testimony. Is this thing's been hit big yeah. time? So, um, so he's left his tracks. Uh, if we just look at them, 
And uh, so in the book of Revelation, it says we have 30 day months at the end. Because it says we have a 1260 day, there's 1260 day year, and we have 42 months. So 1260 days equals 42 months equals three and a half years. So when we do that, uh, 1260 equals 42 months and three and a half years. So someone take calendar or a calculator and multiply 365 times three and a half, 1,278. So it's interesting. We know God's word is true. He says in the time of the end, there's a 1260 day period, which equals 42 months, which equals three and a half years. So what I'm, what I'm looking at in Revelation is God said, this is the timing that we're going to finish on. When we look at the creation, that's the same timing that we were on creation. Now, Yeshua, and I think this is kind of a proof text, he says that everything will be restored. When Elijah comes, he will restore all things. Now, a lot of people look at the verse in Malachi, and they said, remember the statutes and judgments which I gave Moses, my servant? You guys are familiar with those verses, right? And so we, as festival keepers, we say God's restoring the festivals. Okay, that's really cool. But if he's going to restore the festivals, what does he have to do first? The dates, right? So if he gave these things at creation... On a 360-day year, how can we keep the festival at the right time today? We can't. So all, all we're left with, really, is go to the Bible. And, this, and I'll say this again. If you went only by the Bible, you would never have the equinox as your start of the year. The Bible has two things. It says you celebrate the Passover in the month of Abib, or the Abib. We know from the Exodus story that the barley was in the Abib. So if we can figure out what the Abib of the barley is, that then we know because we're supposed to celebrate it when the barley is in Abib. And there's three texts. Three texts that say that. There's no text that say you celebrate the Passover at the equinox. It's not there. But there's three texts that connect the barley harvest to the festival of Passover. It's all, it's all based on the barley. And here's why. Now, this, I think, it, maybe I'm going to try and pull some of these, all these thoughts together. Okay. When we had the, uh, at the creation, we've talked about that. When we have, at the creation, a perfect thing, this is up and down, we can plant any time. God said this would be the beginning. The Abib would be the beginning of months for you. And he said, we're going to tie this thing to the barley harvest. But actually what he, what he really said was we're going to tie this to the revolutions of the, of the uh, earth around the sun. The barley harvest was the first harvest of the year. They used to have 1260 or uh, 360 day years, but now the earth's been stretched out of the orbit somehow, and now it's 365 days. We haven't found where that is yet, except for one place, and that's in Hezekiah, it's in Chronicles, around 700 uh, BC. You guys remember the story that God set the clock back 10 degrees yeah. on the sundial? You know that? I don't know that one. Don't you don't know, know that story? No. Yeah, that's in Second Chronicles, I forget, Hezekiah. Anyways, um, around chapter 30 somewhere, I think. Anyways, at the time of Hezekiah, he was sick unto death, and he wanted to be healed. And uh, Isaiah, I believe it was, was it Elijah or Isaiah? Anyways, one of, those, one of those prophets, Isaiah, I think it was. Yeah, it would have been Isaiah. So Isaiah goes to him and says, what do you want as a sign that you're going to be healed? Because he wanted to know a sign. And then he gave him a choice. Do you want the sundial to go head 10 degrees or back 10 degrees? 
And, uh, and uh, Hezekiah said, well, it'd be an easy thing to go ahead, but I want the sun to back up. So he said, let's, let's have the sun back up 10 degrees. On a sundial, I, I understand they were stepped. A sundial there, we think of something round, but a sundial, they had steps. When the sun came up, it would come up on the horizon and it would come up by steps. And they knew every step was like 10 minutes or something like that. What was it? Uh, 10 degrees was 20 minutes. That's right. Each one divided into a 360 was 20 minutes in the day. So it, it backed up 20 minutes. When you take that 20 minutes and you back it up and do a calculation on it, he stretched it out 20 minutes every day. If you stretch out, let's do that 20 minutes every day for 360, 360 days in the year. If you added 20 minutes every day, so go, so go 20 minutes, so we're dealing with minutes now, yeah. 20 times 360. Yeah. Okay, so that's 7,200. Minutes. Yeah. Now divide that by 60, and that's going to give you hours. Okay, 120. Okay, and then you're going to divide that by 24, because that's, that's 24 hours Five. in a day. Five, Five days. days. Yeah. So, so that's what happened at the time of Hezekiah. On a sundial, we could do that math too. On a sundial, or on the step thing, it was 360 degrees. And it was on a 12-hour day. Okay, so we got 720, right? 720 minutes we're dealing with. Everyone with me? Okay, divide this by 360. That go, that's a degree, one degree. So we're dividing the amount of degrees on the sundial by the minutes we have on the sundial. And so every degree equals what? Two minutes. And he moved it back 10 degrees. That's 20 minutes. That's how you get that. That's right, we've got to look at Bible evidence. We can't just start coming up with stuff. Look at the Bible evidence that's been laid down. Mm -hmm. And um, so at the end. So now this is a really interesting thing. I'm going to, can I stretch your brain just a little bit further? Okay. Now, we know, we know at this time you had, you had poles. And we, you guys all took geography in, in, in social studies, right? And you learned, if I was to draw Canada, something like this, down to Mexico and South America, something like that. Something like that, right? How's that? Pretty good? Yeah. Okay. You know that in, from social studies that the Ice Age actually brought ice way down here, way down into Oregon. They've got glacier markings all the way down there. It's been receding. Mm -hmm. So this global warming thing is completely ridiculous because what is, we've been on a global warming track mm -hmm. since the flood time, since these polar ice caps were so huge, it's been receding. Well, as you get more, it's just like out here. We see it right out here. As you get more dirt showing, what happens to the melting of the snow? It starts to warm, the ground starts to warm up. And around the edges where the ground and the snow come together, it's melting really fast there. It breaks off. You, just, you can break it off. But as you get where there's more snow and ice, it doesn't melt as fast. It's melting always where... The, the darker color meets because the earth's starting to absorb the heat, it melts the snow. Also, when they take the water and they start taking the ice caps back, the water starts to warm up, which melts the snow even faster. Well, if the ice caps were actually formed at the time of the flood, because of the outer space ice coming in and so on, then these were very, very big, but they started to recede. The global warming's been going on a long time. A long time. But now, because, 
Yeah, but now because the polar ice caps are getting really small, this warming is speeding up. And what we should be telling people, it's going to get a lot hotter because Revelation says a promise to God's people is you will neither thirst nor hunger anymore and the sun won't scorch you anymore. So what is that saying? That's talking about the end time. So at the end time, it's going to get really hot. That's what Revelation says. As you, as these glowler, as, right, it'll be just the opposite, is it's going to get really hot on the earth. And the reason is, it's not because we're driving cars. It's because this has been going on for thousands of years. The polar ice caps are receding to the point where the earth is really warming up. Even two, three degrees could wipe out life on the whole planet because we're in a delicate balance on this thing creates all kind of weather shifts and just nothing really works anymore. So at the time of Hezekiah, right here, is God did something very interesting. He lengthened the time of the year. So now it takes 360 days, to 365 days to get around the sun. Now, have you guys played tetherball before yeah. mm -hmm. and you know if you shorten that rope on the tetherball mm -hmm. what happens it goes, um, it goes way faster right okay. it's just whipping around if you don't have that rope where you can actually catch it it has to be the right length mm -hmm. so at the creation the rope length it took 360 days to get around. At the time of Hezekiah, he moves the rope out a little bit. It takes 365 days to get around to preserve life. He did it for our benefit. It wasn't for Hezekiah, it was for us. If he didn't move the earth out a bit to get make the orbit longer, and I use the analogy of the rope, if it wasn't longer, this global warming would have happened a long time ago. It was to preserve life because he had a, a calendar. It's interesting that Hezekiah asked, or that Isaiah, the prophet, asked, what do you want, speed up or slow down? I'm glad he made the right choice. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's interesting. It was Isaiah. It kind of makes sense because God doesn't do anything willy-nilly. He's not playing tricks up there. Everything he does, all of his laws, everything is for our benefit. Everything. Yeah. That's okay. I know. So, well, we're answering it. Okay. So, in that story of Hezekiah, it says that at this time, at this time, at 700 BC, that the king of Babylon sent emissaries. Now, Babylon is quite a ways from Israel. That's where the king of Israel is. They were astrologers there. They watched the heavens constantly because that was signs and all kinds of omens and stuff. The astrologers noticed something. Something happened in the heavens, and it says that he, they, the king of Babylon sent emissaries to Israel to find out what the wonder that was done in the land. They noticed something had changed in, in, at that time. Now, I tried to do some homework on that. The best thing I could find on this is that it was that the historians say that it was around the year 700 that the world, all the different uh, uh, kingdoms like Egypt and Mesopotamia and all those places, they started to change from a 360-day calendar year cycle to a 365-day year cycle. So what that actually means is that's the event that changed the rotation around the sun. And God did it. The historians don't realize that the actual way it happened was contained in the Bible. So, and you can research that. There's some, been some authors that have sort of done a lot of homework on that. Uh, 
I forget, there was a Russian, um, Russian guy that did some pretty good work on that. So here's the problem now that we've been thrown off. So God uses a cycle. He uses the, the, the grain cycle as the first harvest of the year. They would plant the grain in the fall and they would harvest it in the spring. Now, you guys have heard of the first fruits in the Torah. When is the first fruits harvest? At Passover, it was the first fruits of the barley. And at Pentecost, it was the first fruits of the wheat. So it's, it's two different harvests. But you have, in, in the Torah, you have first fruits of all your crops. And what God says, I want the first fruits of all your crops. It's a faith thing that God has asked us to do, to give up the first, you know, everyone waits for that first, you know, first uh, picking, you know, we want that first one. He says, no, that's mine. You can't have that. But we can have everything after that. And it's a, it's a sacrifice that we make. So that's, so it started, the first fruits of the year was the barley. It was the very first thing that was ready. And there was a celebration uh, around the barley harvest. And so what God said, I want the barley, I want the first fruits of the barley um, before you can harvest the barley. And so that was the way it worked. So what happened was, he said, at the time of the barley will be the beginning of months. So at the time the barley's in a bee. So what happened was, is to create this yearly cycle as we're going around, the barley would be the beginning of months for them. So when the barley was in that cycle, it happened. Now, if what people do is by reason, some people have reason that we'll use the equinox. Well, the barley is really close to the equinox, but it's not the equinox. The barley has to be ripe at Passover for the, for the first fruits offering. But it has to be at the beginning of the harvest. It can't be at the end. If it was at the end of the harvest, they weren't allowed to harvest the barley until they had the first fruits. That's what initiated the barley harvest. So they would have done where, it's, where it comes up early around Jerusalem. And they would have gone by that. And as soon as the barley is going to be ready, because if you're doing any kind of work, you know, if I was looking at my raspberries, I can go to my raspberries and I say, you know what, if I was good at raspberries, uh, the way the weather is, two weeks and they're going to be ready. I know that because I'm a raspberry farmer. I can tell how long it's going to be. So they would go to the barley field and they would inspect the field and they could say, you know what, this is close enough to, the, to make this new year because this barley is going to be ready at Passover. They knew that if they waited a month and a half, it's rotting in the field. It was all to teach us something. So he used the agricultural calendar to teach us the plan of salvation. Now, I can't tell you why God did that. All I can tell you is he did it. And so I come along, and who am I to change the way he calculates? I can't do that. I don't have scripture to give me that freedom. Now, the equinox, interestingly enough, the equinox, when we get around here, is usually really close to the barley cycle. So the way he set it up is he wants us to start the year when the days are getting longer. Now, why he's done that, he hasn't said that. But he hasn't said, do it on the equinox. Do it according to the barley. So all we've got to do is do it according to the barley. Anything else is going outside of what his well, word says. Forget, there's two equinoxes a year. There's two solstices and two equinoxes. So where in scripture, the people, the equinox people, where do they pick the spring equinox instead of the fall equinox? What's their Bible for that? Well, what happens is, what happens is, if, we're, if we go on a 30-day month, which is what they were doing, they were going on a 30-day month. So let's say we got 1,260 days. That's the way they were calculating it. That was the original way to calculate it. But when all this craziness happened, it threw the clock off. And so what God said, he says, 
I'm going to give you a way that you can keep this thing as close to you can, as close to you can for a yearly cycle. So he says, every year you're going to fall behind by five days. Because if you're counting 360 day years, you lose five days every year, right? Because the year is actually 365. So we go around once, we lose five days. We go around twice, we lose another five days, which is 10 days. We go another time, we lose another five days. And so people say, well, that's crazy. Let's just go by the equinox. That's good human reasoning, but it's not the way God keeps time. So we go another time and we lose 20 days. Well, the way God fixed it was he says, go by the barley. So they, every four years or so, they would have to add a month because they went, because if you go 30 days before or 20 days before the equinox, when the barley's about ready, the barley's not going to be ready. So it pulls you back into the right time of year every three or four years. It would, it would get rid of those 20 days that have been accumulating in the bank. So the equinox has the same problem because at the end of the year with the equinox, they got five days they don't know what to do with. But God doesn't calculate it that way. It doesn't say add. He just says go by the barley. And the barley actually takes into consideration that loss of time because now we're on a 365 day year. It's God's method to get us back on. And that's the same, people say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Who are we to say it makes sense? That's the way God ordained it. It's just like the Sabbath, you know, why does he want us to keep the Sabbath? Same amount of minutes, seconds, and so on. But he specifically said, I want that day. So we just have to go by what he's telling us to do. Yeah, so, so what, what I tell people is none of us are on the right calendar according to the creation. You know, these people that claim we have the creation calendar, you can't possibly have the creation calendar because we're on a different timetable. The creation calendar had a 360 day year. We don't. So that's why God brought the barley in. The barley wouldn't have had anything to do with the creation calendar because it didn't matter when you planted the barley because you could plant it any day of the year and, but barley had a specific time when they harvested because of this. And, and so that's what brought the barley into the mix was because of that provision. In, but at the beginning, there wouldn't have been equinoxes. That's why it can't be the, the creation calendar because there wouldn't have been an equinox. It was the same every day of the year. Yeah, there's obviously questions that are going to come up that we don't have all the answers. But, but my point to people is, is look, if, we're going to, if all things are actually going to be restored, and I think this is maybe the whole point of the thing, if the festivals are going to be restored, then the timing of the festivals. So everyone's racking their brains on who's got the right calendar. And it's causing all kinds of division. I can't go there because that's a different time and this and this and this and this and I don't agree with them. Is we just need to do our best, do our study. The, the reality of it in my brain is that if God's going to restore all things, then this has to be restored as well. That's just as important as everything else. And when the earth starts wobbling like a drunkard, it just could be he sets the thing straight. Mm -hmm. And pulls it in, because that's where the heat up. That's where he's going to heat it up. So if he's going to restore all things, he's got to restore the timing of the year. And the prophecies say that. It says 42 months, 360 day years, uh, and 1,200 days. Uh, day, 1260 days equals three and a half years. So we know, according to the prophecies, he's going to straighten the clock up. So why would we fight about calendars before God has straightened out the clock? Because it's when the clock's straightened out is when we're going to get it sorted out. We're going to get it back on the creation timing of the year. And it's going to be very obvious. Yeshua had to be keeping the same timing as the Jews. 
So if we can go to the Jews and we can back up in history to when Yeshua was here and we could see when the Jews changed to a moon sighting from an equinox and, and that, then we'd have, we'd have evidence that there's been a change since from Yeshua. But by Bible, we know that Yeshua was keeping the same time as the Jews. So Passover, it says, the whole Passover feast was calculated from even to even. So he st you start the day at even, you end the day at even. That's when the new day begins. So what you're saying there is when Yeshua celebrated, it was the first part of the 14th day. It was the first part of that. So at the even of the 14th, he actually kept it on Passover day. But here's the problem. If you're the Lamb of God and you have to die at the right time, and you have to eat the supper at the right time, what are you going to do? You have to die at the right time. In order to be the Lamb of God that takes away, he has to die on time. That's why he ate the supper early. Because he had to die. It was more important for him to die on time than to eat on time. It was, important, it was more important that he died at the exact moment that the Passover, than that he ate the meal. But it is interesting, he still ate the meal on the Passover day. In Luke it says, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So he had to eat it before he suffered, which because of the Lamb of God. So I hear what you're saying, and it it's almost seems like a conflict, but it really isn't. There's many people believe that there was no Lamb um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, be dogmatic about that. But it's interesting in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it's talking about the Passover. And it doesn't say anything about a lamb, but it says he took bread and he said, this is my body. Well, before that, the lamb represented his body. But he, he took the bread and he said, this is my body. And they were supposed to offer the lamb without bleeding it completely property or properly. It was supposed to have its innards and everything inside, which seems to be really gross. But it all represented Yeshua. So we had the bread and the wine. He seemed to endorse from here on in, it's bread and wine that represents my body and blood. That seems logical. So the focus should be on the bread and the wine for Passover instead of... There's more to the story, but... You know, it, it kind of irks me to, for people when they're claiming we're the only ones that are keeping the right calendar. It's like, no, no, none of us are. So let's not get hung up on that. Is we're going to be, the clock's going to be set straight, according to prophecy. Well, this, this, um, this show we watched, these shows we watched on the Amish last night, I just found it really interesting because... They were doing things, they do things out of tradition. And, and they were being challenged by this guy. He says, you know, how can I, how can I see this in the Bible, what you're saying? How, that, like, this is not in the Bible. You can't get this stuff from the Bible. When he started reading the Bible for what the Bible said, he saw that it was more of a cult than it was a church. And so they, they said, we're done, we're out of here. And so... To me, that's just screaming at me is everything we do, we've got to have solid Bible evidence for what we're doing. When it comes to the feast, the, it's clear the barley has to do with the timing of the feast. It's called when the barley is in the abib, which is in the green stage, it says, you shall keep the feast of unleavened bread, you shall keep... Uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib. Now, I find this interesting, too. Um, this, to me, is a real like challenge for people that want to keep 12-hour days. So, you shall keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days. Okay, so does that mean I can eat leavened bread at, when it's dark? I only need to do this during the day. You know, so it's like, wait a minute. The next one is almost word for word identical. Exodus 
3418. Well, just a sec. We need to finish that verse because I got hung up. Um, you shall eat the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib. That's the same term that's used for the barley when it's in the green stage. So he's given the name of the month at the time the barley is in that stage. Well, in the Abib, yeah. You view it as this stage of development right here. Right. This is at the Passover is done in this in this stage of the barley. Scripturally, a bee was never called the name of a month. No, but they use it as the name of the month. Uh, no, because it's the stage of the barley. Yeah. So it's equated to the stage oh. of the barley, really. Yeah. It's the abib. In other words, the, the month that the barley is in the abib stage, technically. Yeah, yeah mine says month of abib. Yeah. That's what mine says. But what Judy's saying is, in the original, it says the Abib, in the month of the Abib. Abib. Okay, Exodus 9, 31. And the flax and the barley was smitten, for the barley was abib, and the flax was boiled. So the barley was ripening, and we know that was before Passover. Because that was the seventh, was seventh or eighth plague. So they had to have the barley for the first fruits, and that was when it was ripe. But in this stage, before the Passover, it was in the Abib stage. Can you give us the last verse on the barley? Deuteronomy 16, 1. So if we can try and reason this out, the best reasoning maybe I can do here is God has said during the Passover festival, we're going to have a first fruits harvest. That means that we have to have barley that's ripe. In the Exodus story, it says that barley was in the Abib stage before the Passover. That's when it's not ripe yet. So in order to have a ripe first fruits of barley, that means it's in the Abib stage before Passover so that we can have a ripe first fruits. So he calls it the month of Abib, or he says the Abib in some, was it in uh, the original in the Hebrew or something? But anyways, let's forget that for a second. Um, if, if God says, I want the barley when it's in the Abib, when it's in the Abib, it's going to be the beginning of months, and you're celebrating the Passover in the beginning of months. So we know that the barley is in Abib before the Passover because we need ripe barley. Now, I did some experimenting out in the field because I was kind of wrestling with these ideas. Okay. How long does it take grain to ripen? And you guys probably didn't see me out there, but I was checking out, okay, how long does it take to do this? So I was watching it when it was in the, in the head, and I'm rolling it around because the disciples did that. They went to the grain fields, and they were harvesting it. And they were threshing it, actually. That, that's what the Pharisees called threshing grain, and that was illegal because that was work. Well, when you do that, when it's green, in the ear, it doesn't come out. But when it's ripe, you go like that, and you just, you know, and you've got seeds left in your hand. It's like perfect. It's ready for harvest. But it won't do that. So in order for ready, how long does it take from when it's green into the abib? It takes a short period of time. In fact, if you get good sun, you could have that change in a week or a week and a half. It goes from there. And so God said when it's in the abib, then you're going to take then the first month. That's when you're going to start. So that's usually right around the equinox. That's the way it works. So that's what he said is use the barley as a marker. 
So we can't get away from that. So the barley has to be a marker so that we have a first fruits of barley at Pentecost or Passover. So people say, well, we're not in that cycle right now. We're not in the harvest cycle, so we shouldn't have to do it that way. Well, that's outside of scripture. Do, do we think that God would fault us if we we're trying to follow that? People say, well, I don't know when barley's ready in Jerusalem. How am I supposed to know that? How would you know that? Exactly. What do you mean I don't know? There's websites that, are, that do this. This is what they do. We can find out very easily when it is. So by doing it right now, exactly. So right now we can do this. Well, how about when God actually sets the calendar and then we know the exact beginning of the year and we're starting on a monthly cycle. There's no question anymore. There's no question. We got the beginning of the month and we count 14 days. We count till the end of the month, 30 days, 30 days, 30 days, 30 days. And then we get to the 12th month. We got the last 30 days. We start all over again. It's like we don't need to know Jerusalem time anymore yeah, so when we're on the right calendar. I'd like to point to the little child shepherd. How many of you looked up at the sky and pointed out the equinox to your children the other day? How many of you can go to your, your garden and say, honey, look at this grain. This is the bean. Oh, look up there. There's the crescent. That a little child can understand. Well, the beginning of the month. If we saw one new moon crescent, if, if this time period at the end is several years, all we need is one new moon to find. It's 30 days, 30 days, 30 days. Oh, yeah. But this is, this is how God's going to work. He's going to identify when it is. Just like he said to the Jews, you know, we're going to go out there and I'm going to show you which day Sabbath is. I'm going to provide twice as much. So we can expect a supernatural event if God is true to his keeping and true to history. We can expect a supernatural event to get us on the calendar. Pagan religions, they all have the crescent moon. And they, you know, the goddesses that they worship have with the moon goddess and the crescent moon. Like this was all part of paganism. Just, just because they ended up worshipping part of the creation doesn't mean it's evil. Doesn't mean that part of the creation is evil. And, and I hear what you're saying. It's exactly right. But people, people fall prey to worship all kinds of things. We can have a whole list of all the things that they worship. And some of them are natural parts of the creation. And so just because they start to worship certain things, and maybe not worshipping as bowing down, but they've made them top priority in their lives. There's a difference between following a clock and worshiping a clock. So we, can, we have the clock. The stars are part of the clock. The suns, I mean, they have sun worship. So if we're going by the equinox, it has everything to do with the sun. So if, if we categorically say, oh, we can't have anything to do with the moon, well, what about the sun? They, they worship the sun all over the world still worship the sun. So don't go by the equinox because that's directly related to the sun. He's just got his clock so that we can be on the right time. And, and that's what he's used is the sun and the moon and the stars. We get that right from Genesis. Now, if we go to Psalms 104, verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God. You are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty who cover yourself with light as with a garment, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in waters. That's interesting. Who makes the clouds his chariot and walks on wings of the wind, who makes the, his angels spirits and ministers a flame of fire so that it should not be moved forever. You cover it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebu rebuke, they fled. Talking about the flood now. And also when Yeshua calmed the storm. At the voice of your thunder, they hastened away. They went up over the mountains and went down into the valleys to the place which you founded for them. 
you have set a boundary that they may not pass over, that they may not return to cover the earth. He sends the springs into the valleys which flow among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. By them the birds of the heavens have their habitation. So what is this talking about? Just generally, in general terms. What's, what are we looking at here in this psalm? Right, we're talking about the creation, right? We're talking about how God takes care of all of his creation by what he's done. So we keep going in this. Uh, his water, or verse 13, he waters the hills from his upper chambers, which are the clouds. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your works. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and the vegetation for the service of man that he may bring forth food from the earth, the wine that makes glad the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread which strengthen man's heart. So here we are seeing he's just expanding on his creation, how he takes care of things, right? The trees of the Lord are full of sap. And I put in here a little circle here, maple syrup. The cedars of Lebanon, which he planted, where the birds make their nests, the stork has her home in the fir trees. The high hills are for the wild goats. The cliffs are for a refuge for the rock badgers. He appointed the moon for moeds. So he's telling everything about his creation, and then he goes back, he appointed the moon for the moeds. Yeah, but in the creation, there wasn't seasons. Seasons happened at the time of the flood. So there's no way that this could be pointing to, it's moeds, it's, it's the festivals. By, by saying this is not talking about the festivals, we've just changed Genesis 1.14. The, the sun and the moon and the stars are for appointed times. I'm telling you three times in scripture where there's a direct command to observe unleavened bread and or Passover by your beast. So now let's look at the four times you see Ketubah. And let's see how many times they give you direct command to observe Passover and love and bread. Fourth is from the end of the heavens, and is to Kufa and to the ends of it. Where does this say that anything about the first of the year? You have to totally read in feast into, into that. It's not valid. That, yeah, it's not saying anything, that. any reference to this, how you calculate the feast. Okay. There's a point I want to make here. The point is context the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork mm -hmm. the point of is, is God's creation how vast it is and he says everything's on its circuit everything's got a circuit and we know this by modern science mm -hmm. that declares the glory of God it's calculated everything he does is calculated and that's the point here. He's not saying that this is how you tell when this happens is when the timing of your feast. It's not, it doesn't say that. We can reason and, and try and read it into it, but it doesn't say that. Second Chronicles 24, 23. And it came to pass at the Tekufa of the year that the host of Syria, Syria came up against him and they came to Judah and Jerusalem and destroyed all the princes of the people from among the people and sent all the spoil of them unto the king of Damascus. Where does that verse tell me to keep the Passover by the Tekufa then? 1 Samuel 1.20. 1 Samuel 1.20. Wherefore it came to pass when the... King James says time, but the word is yom, which means day. Wherefore, when it came to pass, when the day to Kufa, about after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son. Now, I want to digress here for a second, if I can. Leviticus 23. Okay, let's do the one more verse. So one more verse is a verse for Exodus 34, 22. So the Tekufa, the Tekufa in that verse that you just read is talking about the woman's cycle. And it's the nine months. No, from right. the time she conceived 
Children yeah, pregnancy which is the cycle of birth. Kufa is nine months. Right. Yes, it's exactly. So tikufa exactly. is a completion of a cycle. Yes. And the cycle of the year is 360 days. It, right. That's really the cycle. You can start right. that anywhere you want. It's the cycle of the year. Yes. It doesn't say you start that at the technical when the, the darkness and the light. It doesn't say that. We imply that. Starting at 21, for a little bit of context, six days shall thou work, but on the seventh day thou shalt rest, in eating time and in harvest thou shalt rest. Thou shalt observe the feast of weeks, which is Pentecost, of the first fruits of wheat harvest, which is Pentecost, and the feast of ingathering, which is tabernacles, at the year's Tekufa. If you don't start the year on the barley harvest, you're not going to get Pentecost on the wheat harvest, right? Like, right. Yeah, you you've got to have the barley set. Everything follows the harvest calendar. At the oil yeah. and the grapes. The yeah. olive oil and the olives and the grapes. So the, it's the whole, actually the whole cycle. The barley has to set the stage, and it, it's logical if we're starting here. And he used the, the harvest calendar to represent certain aspects of the plan of salvation. So we're at a slight disadvantage here in the Western world because we don't have a harvest calendar. But the reality of it is, all we have to do is Google it. So we're still without excuse. Yeah, but when he goes back to the, to the original calendar, it's going to be a no-brainer. We just count 30 days. You know, it's dark, it's light. Okay, that's one more day. And we're, we're not going to lose track of time. We're going to know. Somebody's going to know. So all we need is the starting. We need to get out of the gate, and that's what he's going to do. We don't have to worry about it. It's actually, technically, not our problem. It's his problem. Well, no, seriously. Exodus, it's his problem. Exodus 34, 22. I've been looking for Passover and unleavened bread and all these tacufas. I finally found some feast days in the tacufa, but I found Pentecost and Sukkot. It, the Tekufa here, in gathering at the year's end, the year's Tekufa. So year this, oh, this no. one does mention some feasts with Tekufa, but which one? Okay, is so if, if that's the Tekufa and that's at the year's end, that it's just the circuit. Oh. So depending on when you start, if, there, if you want to have a 12 or a 24-hour day, if you start the clock timing at 3 o'clock, you're going to end up at 3 o'clock the next day, right? And so it's just what, why are you starting your circuit? And when we're talking about a tikufa in the relation to a birthing, it's a nine-month circuit. Mm -hmm. So that's what the way the tikufa is, is used. And in the seventh month, it says... At the end of the year. So if you're counting, if you start the tekufa, the circuit, at the end of the year, guess where you end up? The end of the year. You don't end up in the spring. So the tekufa there says it's at the end of the year, but it's talking about tabernacles to tabernacles, one circuit.